Hey. Um, so I was actually thinking I might just um, get started, but first ask uh, a couple people if they would um, write into the question box and just confirm that they can hear me, that I'm, that this thing's on, uh, and we're transmitting sound. Hooray! Thank you to helpful people saying that they can hear me. Um, thank you all so much for coming to this DPLA Community Reps Info Session um, at 5 o'clock Eastern Time on a Tuesday, on Mardi Gras Tuesday. Um, we're really excited uh, that, that this number of people is interested in learning more about the program, and we sincerely hope that you will be enthusiastic to apply at the end of the info session um, and not put off. So we're going to do our best to address any questions that you might have. Um, I want to uh, start by just explaining a few things about GoToWebinar and its control panel for people who have not used it before. Um, all of you, unless you are formally talking during this info session, are automatically muted. This is um, not to make you feel like your voice doesn't matter. It is uh, to create a situation for us where we don't get random feedback uh, from people's mics or telephones or background noise that might distract. But there is a questions box, which some of you have so helpfully used um, to say that you can hear me. Uh, and we encourage you to submit questions during the presentation via the questions box at any time. Uh, if you're having technical problems, if you want to ask for clarification about something, we will be um, answering some of those questions as we go and saving some of the larger ones for what will be an ample um, period of Q&A at the end of the info session. So I want to start by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Frankie Abbott. You can see me listed on the slide. I'm a curation and education strategist for the DPLA, and I am one of um, now three people who manage the Community Reps program. I'm Kenny. Thanks, Frankie. I am Kenny Whiteblum. I'm the manager of Special Projects, and I uh, work with Frankie and Samantha on the Community Reps program. Samantha, do you want to say hello? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Samantha Gibson. I am the Engagement and Use Coordinator at DPLA. Excellent. Um, Samantha is a new and fabulous addition to our Community Reps Management Team. So welcome, Samantha, to your first ever info session also. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the uh, info session format that we're going to follow, it's really pretty simple. And again, emphasis on question and answers for, for people at the end. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes about the program, um, what it is, uh, why you might consider applying, and then um, probably more importantly, you're going to hear from some actual community reps who are in the program. Uh, Kristen Yarmy, who is uh, a fabulous member of our very first class of community reps who still uh, works with us, and the equally fabulous um, Sarah Hawkins. So they're going to speak for a few minutes about their experiences um, and also are, will, are going to be available to answer questions at the end. So I thought it would be useful um, just to get started by putting everybody on the same page, I anticipate that there are uh, a number of different levels of exposure to the Digital Public Library of America as a project on the info session. So I thought it would be good to just establish a, a baseline for what the DPLA is um, and then to think about how that is important to the REPS program. So for those who don't know, and I imagine many of you do, uh, DPLA is a free national digital library uh, that provides access to materials from libraries, archives, and museums across the United States. So emphasis on a few things. Um, the DPLA is free and doesn't require any registration or subscription in order to use it. And it's in the business of providing access. So a sort of a second way to think about what the DPLA is, is that it's actually less a single institution and more a network of partners who have agreed to make their content available through one website. So a, a, a large network of distributed libraries, archives, and museums of various sizes um, who, who sign up uh, to make their, th their items accessible through the DPLA's uh, portal or website. The DPLA is also uh, a, a two and a half year old <laughs> project uh, coming up, I guess it's actually maybe more like uh, two and three quarter years old, coming up on our third birthday since the launch of the uh, website, which was in um, April of 2013. So the DPLA is relatively uh, young and has, I think, a staff as of a few days ago, of 15 people. So it's also a relatively small organization with a um, one central office in Boston, in the Boston Public Library, but a staff that actually um, works sort of distributed across the United States. And finally, I imagine most of you are familiar with the DPLA's website, but um, if you're not, it would be important for you to know where that is. Um, the DPLA has a little bit of an unconventional URL, uh, which is dp.la. 
Um, if you decide to continue and apply to rep and work with us, we can tell you um, the story of why that is. But uh, like it or have a strong negative reaction to it, we hope at least that it is memorable. The DPLA um, has a, a sort of a three-part mission that we like to talk about uh, in terms of three Ps. Um, and this is important to the reps program because um, everybody who does work as a community rep uh, works differently with this mission. Um, so the DPLA is a portal for discovery, so a, a website through which to find materials from all those institutions that I mentioned previously. It is also uh, a platform to build upon, so it is um, essentially a data repository that people use to make um, new and exciting projects or applications. And then the DPLA, is a big part of its mission is also to be an advocate for a strong public option. So for those interested in open access and copyright, that is the third uh, important part of what the DPLA is and what the DPLA is doing. Now, this idea is really important to the REPS program because, um, as I said, when you uh, are a community rep, um, it, the community that you intend to work with is probably going to be interested in one or um, or parts of some of these aspects of the DPLA, right? So it's, uh, for example, I uh, mentioned that I do a lot of work with curation and education projects. And so for um, many education users, using the DPLA as a portal for discovery of research resources is its kind of primary value. We have whole groups of reps um, who do a lot of their service work for DPLA, mostly concentrating on um, introducing users to the website, getting them comfortable with using the website, talking about the advantages of the website. Similarly, um, <clears throat> we have other community reps whose interests are really more technical. Uh, they may work on um, an app building project, that may be how they do their community rep service, um, or they may participate in other kinds of uh, advocacy platforms like hackathons where they get people familiar with the DPLA's um, API, get people using um, its bulk data downloads and things like that. And finally, um, there are people who are community reps because they circulate uh, in a world of open access advocates, and so they're interested in the project from um, a sort of principled point of view, and, and, and they, are in fact, are often uh, in a position to kind of represent the open access mission of the DPLA and to talk about the work of this project in connection with other related projects. So important to think about that mission um, as you consider how you think um, the repping that you might do for the DPLA might fit in um, with those various communities and kind of interests. So why does the DPLA have a community reps program? Well. Um, the DPLA, obviously, as I said, is itself a network of partners. So we have um, an elaborate network of uh, what we call hubs uh, and uh, contributing institutions that are actually responsible for contributing uh, the content that you find accessible through the DPLA. But during the um, two-year-long planning phase, there was also a huge amount of kind of community support for the project. I mentioned the open access mission uh, and also the sort of possibilities for uh, open source software development um, and, of course, the production of free research tools. So the DPLA has had a lot of fans, which it was really lucky and exciting for us, and we thought that we would start the REPS program. Um, I guess we, we started it in uh, December of 2013, so just eight months after the website launched, because we wanted to find um, a constructive way to harness the energy of what was a, a large number of excited volunteers who wanted to help us extend our reach. There were 15 people. Um, <clears throat> we're very eager to learn about how people are using the DPLA. We're very eager to think creatively about how different user communities can engage with the project. Um, but, but again, as 15 people, it's really challenging for us to have the kind of reach that we think that the project deserves. And we had people coming to the organization saying, what can we do to help? What can we do to be supportive? Is there, we'd, we'd like for you know, the folks in our community to be working with DPLA, can somebody come and <clears throat> give a talk? And we thought, what better way than to empower um, individual people to work with their local communities um, to get good information about the program um, and to be advocates for the program in, in their local place. And I'll talk a little bit about the idea of community and the idea of place and how that can work differently for different kinds of reps. But really, uh, community members and advocates have been involved with the DPLA as a project from the very beginning. Um, and so the reps program, in, in a sense, is just a, a sort of way of formalizing that network of people who are excited about the DPLA and what we're doing and want to be involved in it. So an overview of the REPS program. Uh, we are currently accepting applications for the fourth class of REPS. So we have already admitted three classes and they tend to be about 100 REPS. If you've spent time looking at the Meet the REPS page, um, you'll see that we don't currently have 300 REPS in the program and that's because um, people make a commitment of a certain term, which I'll talk about uh, in, a, in a slide or two. Um, 
currently and over the course of time, we have had people participate in the program from all 50 U.S. states and some territories, plus um, international locations, which is pretty exciting. Uh, we have been interested in, in trying to get some geographic reach through the program, although um, a representation of professions, representation of interests, the way that the REPS program supports that three-part mission, those are also um, really important factors in the way that we've thought about growing the program. So we've had folks participate from state libraries, public libraries, K-12 schools, a variety of different places within colleges and universities, and then folks who work in um, technology and publishing and genealogy and other kinds of, I guess I would think of as um, related or, or complementary fields to cultural heritage. Um, the REPS programs, again, this time we would probably be looking to admit a, a sort of class of a similar size. Um, and what is uh, really exciting, I, I think, about the Community Reps program this time around is that we've started doing uh, a more regular cycle. So we admit now community reps. We did we, the first three classes we did a little closer together, but we have now are, are um, stepping back because we've had such a positive experience with the folks already in the program to opening up the reps applications just once a year. So this is that, that time period and that cycle. What are some of the program goals of the reps program? Well, from the DPLA's point of view, um, as I mentioned already, the sort of number one goal of the REPS program is to try to help connect the DPLA to diverse local communities. So what does community mean? Community could mean um, as local an idea as a school that you teach in um, or a class that you're working with in higher education over the course of a semester. Um, again, in, in some exceptional situations, particularly tech situations, the idea of working with community is a more abstract one as people think about how they might develop um, projects, research projects or applications using content from the DPLA. Um, but in general, um, folks who are repping for the DPLA are bringing the DPLA to a particular community and again that can be an institutional community, it can be a professional network, um, it can be a, a group of related organizations within a district, um, but it, it generally is a kind of group of, an art, a group of people that can be articulated. Um, a second goal of the program uh, is that it provides opportunities for the DPLA for, for much greater public engagement with the project. So again, we're a small staff. Um, we really want uh, feedback from various members of the general public about how the project is working, what it's doing, what it could be doing. And although we can't always uh, respond to that feedback in as timely a manner as we would like, um, it's important for us to kind of collect it and feel like we're keeping the, the finger on the, the pulse of public engagement. Um, we also do use the REPS program actually to gather info about how the DPLA website is being used. So we had a community rep actually in the third class who did a, an actual formal usability study, which was really exciting, with um, a number of public library patrons in Vermont, and that gave us some really, really useful feedback. Um, specifically, she did a project about the map and the timeline and the bookshelf. Um, but in general, you know, uh, many reps, as I mentioned earlier, do their repping by presenting the website to different groups of people, and they collect from these events and these engagements really interesting feedback, and we are interested in creating uh, a way of, of gathering that feedback through the reps program. Um, and of course, we're also interested in extending our own network, so one of the goals of the program is to build relationships with um, folks all over the country and to learn from them. Um, it, as I mentioned, the people in the REPS program have a really diverse expertise um, and the DPLA is interested in those people's thoughts about the project um, and the ways in which they feel like we could be uh, extending our reach in their professional world. So the formal uh, roles and responsibilities of community reps, the sort of number one thing, which is kind of a general thing, is that reps are expected to serve as volunteer DPLA ambassadors. So what does that mean? Well, that means generally we assume that people in the REPS program are um, in informal ways uh, going to act as uh, DPLA uh, advocates. So this is kind of more of a conversational bit, um, but, you know, in uh, seeking out opportunities for uh, mentioning the DPLA in conversations, uh, you know, nominating the DPLA for inclusion in lists of research resources, talking up the DPLA to people that they perceive to be interested colleagues, but again in a sort of an informal way. Um, so we do expect reps to, to perform that kind of ambassador role during their time in the program. Important to note probably um, also people do ask this question that there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between reps as ambassadors and geographic places. So we do like to flesh out that map that you see on the Meet the Reps page, but ultimately um, the, the, there, we sometimes have, you can imagine, we have a number of reps, you know, say in Brooklyn or uh, within a particular state or I know 
Um, last year we got a, a terrific group of applicants from Madison, Wisconsin, and we admitted many of them into the program, even though they were all in the same place because they were diverse in other kinds of ways and we thought that they might work well as a team. Um, so again, the idea of DPLA ambassadorship is, is, a, is a not constricted by geography. The second uh, role of community reps um, is that we do ask reps to organize at least one activity um, that shares DPLA in a new way or with a new audience within the calendar year that they are a community rep. So we consider this to be a pretty low bar and to be totally honest, most of the people in the program um, probably exceed this. Uh, again, not everybody is doing um, sort of a formal outreach activity like a presentation or a talk or a workshop. Um, but people in their time that they are reps do generally sort of engage with the project um, multi in multiple ways within the course of a year. But the formal requirement is one activity that shares DPLA with a new audience or in a new way within a calendar year. So if people are doing that, which we would consider to be a pretty small commitment of time, then they are fulfilling their repping obligation um, in the eyes of the, of the project. So what are some uh, ways in which people do this, uh, fulfill this kind of activity expectation from the program? Well, first of all, as I already mentioned, um, they generally are engaging with communities that they're already familiar with. So reps do have a more challenging time when they are trying to proceed with both creating a community and um, advocating for DPLA within that community. So often reps work is really kind of a natural extension of uh, work that folks are already doing um, or communities that they're already engaged with. So some ideas, some, some good things that reps have done in the program. Uh, giving, again, a talk or presentation within their institution or professional network, um, hosting a DPLA hackathon, um, developing and sharing a classroom activity that has to do with the DPLA or a syllabus, uh, developing an app, uh, making a video or a tutorial about the DPLA, um, or hosting a workshop, again, at a sort of professional conference at, at some level within their you know, district or, or state um, or sometimes region. Important um, to, to point out that we really want to emphasize the, the idea of the feedback loop between the organization and the reps because these activities um, that reps do have a lot more value when they are reported back to us, which is an emphasis of the program. So when people do go out and do an activity, um, again, whether that is more of a personal project or um, an outreach engagement with an audience, we do ask them to write it up for us uh, in brief. Uh, tell us what happened, who was there, what they learned, what kinds of feedback they got. Um, and so, in that sense, that's the way that we collect information about not just what reps are doing, but also how what they're doing is being received by the communities that they're trying to work with. Um, finally, uh, we ask that um, reps do share experiences with the staff, as I just mentioned, as well as other reps and the DPLA community. So we have um, some community reps who, for example, are very active on social media uh, and, and will talk about events that they're doing, which is always great, although not required. I'm not a huge social media person, so I feel you if that's not your medium. Um, we do also have a community reps Google group where people do uh, share questions that they have, share ideas. Sometimes folks do a little bit of reporting out on things that they've done. Um, and, and reps have really usefully, I think, shared um, slide decks uh, and other kinds of materials that they've used to just, just help get feedback and, and save time. Um, Kenny and Samantha and I do produce um, some outreach materials that people are, are able to take and repurpose and modify um, for their particular audience, but um, many of the community reps have also really been instrumental in creating um, you know, slideshows and, and other kinds of resources that other reps have used. Um, and so we do expect that reps in the program participate in that kind of experience of sharing and being willing to talk about what they're doing and, and being responsive if, if they're asked questions and the like. So coming towards the end of my talking piece, um, I, we just wanted to address a few frequently asked questions about repping. Um, again, feel free to ask these again if my answers to them are not clear in the Q&A. Um, uh, we thought that these four questions particularly um, deserved a little bit of time. Um, so the first one is, how does being a rep benefit me? I've talked a lot about how the reps program benefits the DPLA, um, you know, but always important to think about how being a rep might, might benefit you. And I think probably the, the most common thread, as I said, uh, between all of the reps is that the, generally there are people who come to the program because they think the DPLA is great. They believe in its mission. They think it has real value for you know, the students that they work with um, or the, the colleagues that they work with. For some people, 
Uh, there are networking benefits to, to being better connected to the organization. Uh, for others, that might be a useful service item on their resume. I have written some um, letters of recommendation and other things for reps that I've worked with. Um, you know, in addition, though, the, the sort of if you're interested in the DPLA or projects like the DPLA, being a rep, I think, is, is exciting because it does give you a little bit of an inside track on the organization. So you've got information about our plans. Um, you have regular, fairly regular contact with a DPLA staff member. Um, we also do try to organize um, webinars and other kinds of opportunities that are for the reps. You know, we had now probably a year and a half ago, we did have a sort of a strategic plan meet and greet with the executive director of DPLA, Dan Cohen. So we do, um, again, try to send reps out into the world to represent the organization who are in the loop kind of about what the DPLA is and sometimes is not really doing right now. Um, and so that, that could be of benefit to you depending on your professional background. Um, question number two, uh, how much time will community repping take? Um, I, I think that I can safely say that for the vast, vast majority of reps, community repping doesn't take that much time. And um, generally, you are exchanging uh, emails with your designated staff member, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I'd say three to four times a year. Um, we do ask the selected community reps to come to a one-hour webinar when they first start the program. Again, just to start off with some good baseline information about the organization and who we are and what we're doing. Um, and, you know, then some, in, some time devoted to um, that one activity, as well as however much time you as a rep would be interested in spending, you know, looking at the listserv and, and things like that. So, um, Kirsten and Sarah can give some comment on this, but I think it's safe to say that most of the folks in the program don't spend very much time. We intend it to be a very small commitment of time. Um, question number three, how long am I signing up to rep? Um, as I've already mentioned, um, you would be applying to rep in the program for one year, and that year would start in March 2016, and it would end in March 2017. So what we do is we ask people to make a one-year commitment, and then we check in with them at the end of that year, and we say to them, um, are you interested in staying on? And uh, many of them do elect to stay for a second and sometimes third year and sort of continue. They feel that they have time, they feel that they have multiple avenues for sort of doing outreach, they want to stay engaged with the project, and others who we continue to have a fabulous relationship with sort of say, I've spent my year repping, I did some good things, but I've kind of done what I feel that I can do right now for whatever reason, and we, um, you know, stay in touch with them, but they don't, they don't rep longer than 12 months, so those are all options available to people signing up for the program. You're not necessarily signing up to be a rep, you know, for, for the next decade. If that's not what you want, it's sort of about what you want, um, again, because you were volunteering your time to us, which we're very appreciative. Um, question four, uh, how will I stay in touch with the DPLA? Um, well, uh, Kenny, Samantha, and I divide up the community reps in the program, and we assign everybody a staff contact. So as part of the admissions process, you learn who your staff contact is, and that's your point person. So if you need help brainstorming how to do your outreach activity, um, that's the person that you get in touch with, and they are responsible for answering your questions or finding someone within the organization who can answer your questions. Um, they also will check in with you uh, every few months. Um, they will be in charge of mailing you free DPLA um, promotional materials if you can make use of them uh, in your local communities. So we, that, I think, is an important part of the, of the program. Every rep is connected to a staff member, and that's their kind of go-to person um, for the things that they need from the organization to do their work as a rep. Um, this is a now somewhat outdated photo of the DPLA community <laughs> at the very first DPLA Fest. Um, but, you know, on a final note, we're always looking to grow the DPLA community um, because, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on DPLA as a, a cultural heritage institution project and DPLA as a tech project, but really, DPLA from the beginning has been as much a sort of social project as anything, and so the REPS program is a really exciting way to continue to honor that spirit of the project and to grow that. So I'm going to stop talking, um, and I'm actually going to um, now ask Kristen Yermi if she would speak a little bit about her experience as a community rep. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Okay. How's my sound? Can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, so, hi, everybody. I'm Kristen. Um, 
I'm a digital collections librarian. Um, so I'm really interested, in, and my primary interest in DPLA was um, increasing exposure for my collection. So just I do all this work, and I want more people to see it. Um, but I thought I would tell you, since Frankie brought up, you know, why would you want to be a DPLA rep? I thought I would tell you my DPLA origin story. Um, so way back in 2012, which feels like forever ago now, um, I was at a conference called Digital Directions in Boston. Um, for anyone who's not a librarian, it's a conference that's run by the Northeast Conservation Center. I always get their acronym wrong. Um, but it's lots of you know practical presentations. How do we digitize things? How do we describe things? And throughout the whole three days, um, people kept saying, we need, to, we need to work together on this. Like, we can't do this all on our own. And there were a couple projects that people mentioned where you know, a handful of universities would work together on something, um, or ARL, the Association of Research Libraries, might be doing something. And it was very frustrating for me. I work at the University of Scranton. We're kind of like a medium-sized institution. So we're not really like, I don't have a computing center. I don't have a supercomputer. Um, we're not really able to participate at that really, really high level of you know big universities figuring out how to solve a problem. Um, and then the almost it was almost the last presentation of the conference was Emily Gore, who of course is one of our DPLA staff members, and she gave an introduction to DPLA, which hadn't even launched yet. It was still kind of just an idea that people were working on, and her presentation just blew me away. Um, I had the sense of like this changes everything. Um, it was a grassroots project. You know, everybody could get involved. She told us we could listen in on the, the conference calls and sign up for projects. Um, and it was just so exciting for me to, you know, everyone's saying we need to collaborate and here is this organization that is doing it and doing it well. Um, and she said something that stuck with me for a long time. She said, your collections can take on new lives. And so that's when I fell in love with DPLA and it's been a love affair ever since. Um, so in, in 2014, um, when the first uh, round of applications for DPLA rep, reps was announced, I knew I definitely wanted to get involved. Um, so, so that's why I'm a rep. Um, how do I rep and what do I do as a rep? So for me in Pennsylvania, my, my big priority was to try to do whatever I could to help get a state hub. Um, we didn't have um, a service hub available to us back in 2014, and we do now. So I consider that a big success. Um, so a couple things that I've, that I've done. Um, Frankie mentioned uh, a lot of reps kind of doing DPLA as part of their regular job, and that's definitely an approach that I took. So kind of looking at the activities and meetings and conferences that I go to and seeing what I could do to bring DPLA with me. So doing a poster, proposing a lightning talk, um, you know, even just talking with faculty on my campus when they're doing digital humanities discussions. Um, but a lot of what was really surprising to me, Frankie mentioned a lot of informal conversation, and that is, I think, where I've made the most impact as a rep. You know, if, if I talked about DPLA, people would come up to me later um, on a shuttle bus or just in the hallway or at coffee break and talk to me about their collections or a project that they were working on. Um, or even just someone who saw me tweet something on Twitter would follow up to ask me about what TPLA was doing. So there was just a lot of um, just connecting with people and getting them excited about this thing that I'm ridiculously excited about. Um, I also put in a lot of effort to connect with other reps, so working especially in Pennsylvania um, to do things together, to propose presentations together, but also just to see what everybody's doing. Um, the, the reps Google group has been really, really helpful to see um, what ideas are out there, and like Frankie said, we, we share slides, we share images, which is always really helpful. Um, so yeah, a, a lot of it, when I first started as a rep, it was kind of, okay, I need to have an event or an activity, and it ended up, for me, being a lot more organic than that. It was, I'm, I'm ridiculously excited about this, and I bring it up at every single opportunity I can think of. Um, so it's actually been a lot of fun. Um, in terms of benefits, you know, what has this done for me? So, so first of all, not like, um, I did this on my own, but working with the PA reps, working with a lot of our institutions in Pennsylvania, we do have a service hub now. So for my collections, that's a huge, huge um, improvement for me. We're going to be able to get a lot more usage out of the content that we're putting out. 
Um, for me, more personally, I think what's been really fun is to develop a new network. Um, I've met people at institutions in Pennsylvania and around the country that I never would have run into otherwise. Um, I've met people in different fields, digital humanities, genealogy, um, Wikipedians, you know, people that I never would have would have reached out to otherwise. Um, we do a lot of just fun, you know, who's going to a conference and are there any other reps going and can we do a meetup? So there's a lot of just social interaction and ideas that get thrown around that it's really not a slog, it's more like an exciting project and something that we all do together and celebrate um, advances and progress together. Um, I will say on a non-personal note, I, I know a couple DPLA reps who have landed jobs related to what we do, so that might, might happen for you, I don't know. Um, I also have landed some pretty good DPLA swag. I have some t-shirts, um, I have a water bottle that Frankie sent me, so you can never discount that. Um, but I think most of all, for me, it's just the sense of, I really think DPLA is transforming the cultural heritage world. So not just for libraries, but for museums, for students, for teachers, um, for just people who think it's cool. It's so transformational, and for me, just to feel like I get to be a part of that, um, it, it's just inspirational. You know, I work on things every day, and I work on all of this metadata, and you start to feel like, does anyone ever really see this? And when you're thinking about DPLA, it's like, this is why I do what I do, and this is why it's so important. Um, so that's my DPLA experience in a nutshell. Thank you. Oh, that's so nice. <laughs> Thank you, Kristen, so much. Um, and I, again, if folks have specific questions for Kristen, she's going to be here for the Q&A portion. Yep. Um, so I will turn the mic over to Sarah Hawkins. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Sarah Hawkins. I am the resource librarian for East Central Regional Library in Minnesota, and I um, will be headed into my second year as a community rep for DPLA. Um, I had been kind of a fan of DPLA from the very beginning and was watching what they were doing um, and was really excited about their work, but it took me until the last class to like take the take the step myself and realize that um, I had something to contribute, that they weren't um, necessarily looking for, you know, people in institutions that had a um, a lot of money or resources to spend on being advocates for DPLA, and that was, you know, my personal flaw that I didn't see that up front, but that I eventually saw it and realized that, hey, it is just about these individual connections and one-on-one, -on -one, you know, informal conversations in some cases, and that really, as long as you care about DPLA, um, anyone can do it. And for me, um, I came on as a rep last spring, and I was already doing um, some work with DPLA as a public library um, public library participation patient project person. <laughs> I don't know how you say that. Um, but with the PLPP project, uh, we were starting to contribute our content to Minnesota Digital Library, which was is one of the service service hubs of DPLA and thus having our content in DPLA. So that was really exciting for us. Um, to have our cultural heritage content, you know, available, and we are a, um, you know, a small regional public library system. We cover a lot of geographic area. We don't have the resources to digitize things ourselves. So being able to um, submit our content and have it available on a state and national level was really huge for us. And then, of course, because our content was there, we really wanted to get our communities excited about it. Um, and so a lot of what I have done is. Um, trying to create, you know, mini ambassadors in our staff. I've done a lot of staff training um, for our branch librarians across 14 branches, and actually I know that two of our branch librarians are on the call today, so I'm hoping that means that they've taken up um, the torch and will then, you know, become super ambassadors in their local, more localized communities. Um, but then beyond that, a lot of what I've done is just being an advocate for DPLA and then our local service hub wherever I can, um, attending our annual you know, meetings here in Minnesota, keeping up on the listservs, um, sharing that information out on social media and in blog posts to my other you know, librarian friends, to our staff, 
um, and then stuff that's applicable is directly to our community of six counties. Um, and, you know, writing and press releases wherever I can about that sort of information. And then also, um, like what Kristen said, I, what I think, where I think I've had the most impact is with people who I run into um, in different areas that are interested in cultural heritage and then them not knowing about DPLA or not understanding and just being able to have those conversations and make sure that we're, they're on the same page, they understand, they're not intimidated um, by what you know our service hub and what DPLA is doing and like if we can do it and be involved and care and share, um, anyone can. And so for me it's been, I've connected with quite a few of our historical societies who I've seen or been involved in um, grant processes with who were applying for like their own digitization um, to, to be able to digitize on their own. And I was going to them and saying, hey, are you aware that, you know, Minnesota Digital Library exists? And then beyond that, DPLA exists. And you can work with Minnesota Digital Library and have your stuff available in Minnesota Digital Library and then beyond that available on DPLA. And why wouldn't you take advantage of the experts? And why wouldn't you um, not create, why, why are you thinking about creating your own individual silo when instead you can create this open access world and it's not all about subscriptions, you know, local historical society subscription dollars, it's about sharing that information wherever we can. Um, so I have, I, I think that's for me been the, the most gratifying is to be able to see those communities start to open up and change their, their attitudes. Um, and I'm in the near future doing that in another community. We'll be going to them and telling them about, you know, just the education piece. This is Minnesota Digital Library. This is the Digital Public Library of America. Take advantage of looking at the resources that are there and also think about, you know, rather than digitizing on your own, think about doing and sharing your content through this great resource as well. For, you know, um, it's a two-way street. Um, but yeah, and then again, free swag. Who doesn't want that? I mean, I was already talking about DPLA wherever I could, and now I get to wear my cool t-shirt whenever I'm talking about it and bring my water bottle to work and have people ask questions like that. That's about it, but I'm happy to answer questions. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Sarah also got encouraged people to come to the info session, which is pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty exciting and meta, Sarah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, thank you both so much for, for talking about your experiences as reps. You've both been such a pleasure to work with. Um, and I actually just wanted to throw out a final comment when I'm thinking of it. I don't know if there are people on this call um, who have followed the growth of DPLA's education project, the primary source sets project, and the sort of research that, that predated that project. But uh, as a little shout out to the reps program, I mean, all of the ideas that became that project started in my conversations with uh, reps who worked in uh, as, you know, humanities professors in higher education and reps who worked in um, K-12 schools and school librarians. Uh, they were all part of the sort of kernel of research about that and thinking about that and, um, and initial work. So the reps program, you know, in that instance and, and in, in lots of different aspects of the organization has actually really been an important place for us on the staff to bounce ideas off of, of interested people who care about our success. Um, Kenny, I think I'm going to turn it over to you to maybe moderate some Q&A, and I hope that folks will ask questions. There's no, no question that's off limits in this info session, so please um, ask us any, anything that would help you make your decision about whether you might be interested in applying to the program. Sure, yeah, so folks, um, if you have questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat or question window, and uh, I will uh, post them to the group, and then uh, ask them aloud. So, um, yeah, as Frankie said, feel free to ask anything other about DPLA, about the work we do, about the good of the program, or um, about our two guests. Okay, so. Let me just quickly post this. I got one. Um, 
application process from BERT. Um, so the application process is, is pretty lightweight. We have an, an, uh, an application on our website right now under community reps. Um, we, can, we can share a URL to that. Um, and basically it's um, a pretty small application that uh, just sort of asks folks to um, collaborate on the communities you might serve, um, maybe an idea or two you might have for um, an outreach activity. Um, such as Frankie has just described, you know, there are a variety of opportunities out there. So just sort of to maybe list one of those in three to four sentences and a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in the program. So not a, not a, not a particularly onerous process, but just a little bit about yourself, what types of communities you're interested in serving or community you're interested in serving and what type of things you might want to do. And that's on our website under um, Get Involved Community Reps. Um, um, go ahead, worth Frankie. maybe, no, I was going to say worth um, adding. So you fill out that application and then and the three of us review applications. Um, we take a, a good number of the people who apply to the program into the program, but uh, like Kenny said, we, we mostly select people on the basis of their ability to articulate uh, what we think would be a useful outreach activity, but doesn't make them um, obligated to do that activity, but that people can kind of conceive of, of a use they might make of, of the program. Um, and then uh, also their ability to kind of discuss some of the communities that they might work with as a rep. Um, that those, those are really the two things that we look for in the application. And to be honest, it, it generally takes us a very short period of time to make decisions. So the application closes February 19th, and um, by the end of February, we likely will have been in touch with folks um, about their candidacy for the program. And then we do the um, intro webinar that I mentioned in early March. So it's pretty, pretty rapid, um, pretty rapid pace. Well, thanks, Frankie. Um, uh, next question. Does DPLA provide any funding to attend local or national conferences? Um, that's a good question. As of right now, we don't really have much in the way of funding to support community reps, um, travel, or attending of conferences. Um, we do, however, try to support reps if they are going to a conference, um, um, you know, with like swag or other materials. Um, you know, I think that's something that we're interested in doing. Right now, the, the funding isn't quite there. We have, um, in the past, supported some travel for reps to come to our annual event, DPLA Fest. Um, but we don't, right now, offer much funding to attend local or national conferences. Um, maybe in the future, though. We have, in some um, very specific situations, like put a little bit of money towards an info table and things like that. But That's true, yeah. We haven't paid for people's travel, if that distinction makes sense. So it's, it's more so been local people willing to volunteer time in a place where a, a conference is happening and we've, we've put up the cost of the you know, booth or whatever, so that then they've staffed it, which is very generous of them. <laughs> um, I'll add in as a rep that um, once you're in and can start talking with people that work around you or near you, there might be other opportunities. So for example, our new our brand new shiny Pennsylvania State Hub, um, you know, there are opportunities here and there for for funding. Um, I've also gotten some small travel funding from different organizations that I've gone to speak to, like they've helped reimburse me for gas or something like that. So there may be opportunities out there once you get started. Great. Okay. I'm just looking through the list here. Um, the next one, if you are relatively new in your community, I recently moved, are there people on staff or other community reps that can give you guidance on how to plan and carry out successful events? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, you, if you are accepted to the reps program, um, you will have a staff contact, um, either Frankie, Samantha, or myself, and we are always happy and willing to set up times to chat with our reps, to answer questions, think through ideas. And um, other community reps are also um, very 